Welcome to the Wellbeing Designers Podcast. My name is Reka Deak. I am your host. This podcast is about well-being at work and in life. We discover how we can design the future of well-being together so we can create human-centric organizations and a sustainable work life. In the first season of the podcast, I talked with the first generation of well-being leaders in big organizations. Usually, they were the very first ones in their organization ever to have the title of Head of Wellbeing or similar. In the second season, starting with episode 9, you will meet similar people again, and I invited some other interesting profiles as well. All these people work on wellbeing on a systemic level. Their mission is related to make the world a better place through focusing on wellbeing. In the past years, especially since COVID, employee well-being got on the top of the agenda, not only for companies worldwide, but even some countries and other official institutions started to call for action. In the Wellbeing Designers podcast conversations, I would like to highlight the work of those sometimes invisible people, leaders, who are either in charge of well-being in organizations and trying to navigate amongst the growing amount of well-being offerings while connecting efforts to business impact and most importantly, create real value for employees. Or they are those leaders who are doing their best to create international forums to exchange, raise awareness and take action on well-being and people sustainability. They might be the ones whose responsibility is to take care of hundreds, thousands, or ten thousands of people's well-being. They might be the ones who keep decision makers and CEOs engaged about the topic of well-being. They might be the ones who are proving that employee well-being is a strategic enabler of sustainable performance and business success. They might be the connectors between well-being leaders across companies and countries. I call these people well-being designers. Enjoy listening to them and learning from them. Together, we can design a human-centric work life and the future of well-being. Our guest today is Jonathan Fisher. He is a cardiologist, certified mindfulness teacher, and well-being and resiliency leader at Novant Health, based in the U.S., supporting a team of 38,000 people. He is also the founder of Mind Heart Now, delivering keynotes and workshops on mindfulness, stress mastery, total well-being, and heart-centered leadership for teams and organizations globally, including IBM, Bank of America, IE Business School, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and many others. Jonathan's mission is to help others harness the power of the mind-heart connection to create a kinder, more compassionate world. He lives in Charlotte, North Carolina, with his wife, Julie, and they three teenage children and two dogs, Cosmo and Hugo. You can find more information about his upcoming book, Just One Heart, on Jonathan's website, which I will link into the description of this podcast. Just One Heart, a cardiologist guide to healing, health and happiness, is a practical guide to inner workings of the mind-heart connection, helping readers master their stress and develop a healthy and joyful heart. Good morning, Jonathan. Welcome Hi, Rick. To the, yeah, welcome to the Wellbeing Designers podcast. Before we do anything, I would really like to ask you to guide me through some mindful moments because this is uh, something that I understand comes very natural to you. I'm happy to. I'm happy to be here. Just taking a nice deep breath into your belly. 
Feeling the air moving in. Exhaling slowly and completely through your mouth, all the way out. Let it all out. Let go of something. One more deep breath in through the nose. Exhaling as slowly as you can. See if you can let go of any tension in your shoulders, in your brow, in your jaw, in your belly, in your hands. Just let gravity pull you down and let earth support you. Arriving completely in this moment now. Feeling into the body. Letting your senses open. Being ready for what comes in the next moment and what comes up in this conversation together. When you're ready, you can let your eyes open. It makes a difference to start it like this. I used to think it took, you know, half an hour of meditation. This is a practice that I do before I enter the examination room. When I see my patients in the cardiology clinic, it could be as quick as one or two or three seconds as I'm knocking on the door. I just feel my feet on the ground. I let go of the interaction I was just having. And I set myself up to be open and receptive and compassionate for the next person that I'm about to experience. I had the chance to experience something like this, even in the corporate world, between Zoom meetings or even, you know, sometimes personal meetings. The virtual and hybrid work gave a push for this kind of mindful check-ins. Mm. But still, it might, you know, not be for everyone. <laughs> yeah. Know, but... I, you know, I agree. It's, it's certainly something where those of us who have the practice, we didn't know about the practice until we learned it, first of all, and we all have different degrees of resistance and openness to new ideas. And in the corporate world, the prevailing culture is not one that is open to slowing down, checking in, introspection. There's so many outside forces and we get into patterns of moving fast and making quick decisions without feeling our intuition. So I hear you what you're saying. And because the benefits are so strong, there are ways that I've found and I know you've found to offer these practices for so people can feel better, be better and be more successful in their business and in their life. That beautifully said. Thank you, Jonathan. I shared uh, your short bio at the beginning with the listeners. I just wanted to mention how we met. So I sent you a message in April 2020 because that's when somehow the algorithm allowed me to discover you and your mm. post. And I wrote that, thanks for connecting. It makes really happy to see your profile, specifically what I mean. I see that many times doctors are trained to heal others, but not really trained in how to to take care of their own well-being. Plus, the other aspect is that they often don't heal in a holistic way. And I am not even talking about the emotional and mental side of uh, physical illnesses, but they tend to focus only just on one part of the body and not on the other parts. So I was hoping that you know we, we keep in touch. And then you left me a, a voice uh, message as a response afterwards. And then this is how our uh, connection started. So yeah, I really appreciate that. Yes, I'm going to give a shout out to LinkedIn, <laughs> who connected <laughs> us, right? Um, yeah. yeah, I never knew um, that I was very hesitant uh, three years ago to join LinkedIn when I, you know, I knew nobody there. And I said, what is this for? And I had a feeling that there was some special uh, people out there that I could start connecting with even outside of my own, my own world, my own specialty, my own institution. And ever since then, it's just broadened my horizons and made me a fuller person. And I'm grateful that you sent me a message and that we've been connected uh, with some other mutual friends as well. Please share a bit about your uh, background, who is uh, Jonathan Fisher as a person, and then we can go into the depth mm. of your professional uh, side and then, of course, uh, your book as well. I always struggle with this because there's so many ways to describe ourselves. There's the way we describe ourselves so other people can get a quick idea of who we are, which is necessary for these things. And then there's the way that we describe ourselves to ourselves, which for me is very different than the way I would describe myself to the outside world. So 
I'll start with the, the requested one, which is for people who don't know, I live in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm married and I have three teenagers and I am a cardiologist. So I'm a heart specialist. I'm not a surgeon. I'm a, a heart doctor who listens, who listens to other people trying to be like a detective, figuring out what's really going on deeper and deeper beneath the surface, whether it's a symptom of chest pain or trouble breathing, irregular heartbeat, high blood pressure, problems with cholesterol, getting to the root of the problem instead of a quick fix. And I've been doing this now since 1998 is when I graduated medical school in New York. And ever since then, I've been seeing 20 to 30,000 patients, I think, overall. And in the meantime, realizing that it's not simply enough to care about other people and to serve other people because i thought that i would just give and care for others and that would make me have a wonderful life but it didn't work out like that instead i found that i was giving but it became very mechanical and i started to regret and resent the work that i was doing because i had no time to take care of myself didn't really know what that meant actually to deeply care about myself. I had very little time during the day to even take a break. And I, I came to a place where I was really struggling with some deep depression and anxiety, isolation. And there were some traumatic events with patients where I had watched people die that I never had a chance to process. And so I had to do some healing of my own. And as I did my healing, I read that it's helpful to share your story of healing as you're going through it. So I did that. And lo and behold, a lot of other doctors and nurses and leaders and business people and dads and moms said, I thank you for sharing openly. It's really helping. So that's part of my journey as well. Hmm. Thanks for sharing such a deep journey. How does your day look like today? And, you know, maybe what is different compared to this other mm. life that you used to have? Because you still work, as I understand, in the same system, mm -hmm. but as a different person. I love how you said that. <laughs> and that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So many people, when I'm sharing, say, don't tell me, you know, what worked for you. I don't need help. I need to change the system. And I appreciate that there's been a nice shift in the world of well-being over the last decade, away from yoga and meditation and towards looking at these deeply broken systems based on a, a Western capitalist model that really destroys people's health and well-being. It's almost designed to do that. It's designed for profits rather than the people themselves. So you ask me what my day is like, and it depends on the day of the week. I have two official roles in my job, which is a full-time job. So Three days a week, I'm a cardiologist, which means I see patients, you know, 24 patients a day with all sorts of conditions. And then sometimes I spend days at a time or weekends on call in the hospital for emergencies, people, life and death situations, their hearts are stopping or going too fast, having heart attacks or hearts that are failing. So that's 60% of my job. The other 40%, I am a, a physician executive on a very special team in the large healthcare system that I work for called Novant Health, which is in the southeastern US in the Carolinas, we have 40,000 employees and I'm on a team called the Office of Wellbeing and Resiliency. And we've been around for a few years, one of the first in the country starting around a decade ago, saying that we need these types of teams to support healthcare systems. Because if we don't take care of the people taking care of our patients, our patients are going to suffer. So I spend two days a week doing that. And as an example, uh, yesterday morning, I was invited uh, by the CEO of our company, Carl Armato, to um, lead the quarterly uh, leadership retreat. And I said, what would you like me to share? And they said, whatever it is you do. <laughs> so I guided them in some practices. We did about six or seven different uh, mindfulness, uh, positive psychology practices, embodiment practices, some gentle yoga. And we talked about executive presence and emotional intelligence and all the good stuff that people do work in. So that was yesterday morning. Later on in the day, I sat in front of a charitable foundation board requesting funds to support the work we do to support our nurses and our team members and our doctors, where we 
take nurses who are struggling during COVID offsite out of the hospital for three days. And my colleagues and I, and my boss, Dr. Tom Jenicki, we lead them in a three-day coaching retreat. And we help people look at the roots of where they are in their current day and what struggles they're having and help them out. So that's just an example. And then today, in a few hours, I'm going to be leading the whole system. I've recently opened up a, a six-part mindfulness, introduction to mindfulness course for our system. So we get a few hundred people on Zoom at lunchtime for 45 minutes, and I take them through all the aspects of mindfulness and practice. And then some days I do a separate program, which is on positive psychology, which is the science of well-being. And I've been studying that for a decade, and I've designed a year-long course in that. So these are some of the fun things that I get to do. I'm either caring for people's physical hearts or their emotional hearts. That's amazing. As I understand that the courses are inside your company, right? So these are for all the people who work at Novantel's. Yes, the courses are for all the different job families, from the executive mm. level to the environmental service and people who work in the cafeteria, doctors and nurses. And then I didn't mention that on the outside, I travel all around the world and give talks for businesses and places like IBM and Bank of America and various other places in my extra time. In my perspective, it makes a difference to hear these things from a doctor than, you know, someone who doesn't have a medical degree because, mm. yeah, we come from a history where these like mindfulness or related practices were considered to be like woohoo in the system. And mm. now they are really embraced by people like you. I think that's a very interesting point. It cuts both ways. On the one hand, physicians may have some more credibility, and I call myself the mindful heart doctor. Part of that is so that I can help introduce these practices to make care better for our patients and for our providers and even for our leaders. Yesterday, I was teaching them the practice of self-compassion, and I got some looks like, what is self-compassion? And I, I explained that, you know, unless we can deeply be compassionate, caring, and loving for ourselves, we might not have the precise tools to do that for other people. So it is, it is a fun place for me to be right now. And yet I find that my best contributions come in partnership with other people like you and people who are outside of medicine. I really think that kind of partnership is the best, not just the sciencey nerdy side, but also the business angle and the spiritual side. And getting back to what you said, how can we take a holistic approach to be as inclusive as we can? to reach as many people as we can using the language that individuals understand and respond to. And it's not the same for everyone. You know, on this podcast uh, before, guests were more on the side of being a uh, head of well-being in, in uh, organizations which are not related to healthcare. So I uh, consider today's episode uh, special in many ways. Talking to a mindful doctor, of course, the highlight. Plus, you also work in an organization and you are uh, doing both, practicing yourself these techniques, plus you bring that uh, to your patients. How did this start in your organization? Did mm. you and your journey have some rippling effect? In my organization, it started a little over a decade ago. And it started by my mentor and colleague, Dr. Tom Jenicki, who is our chief well-being officer. A little over a decade ago, as a family practice physician, was struggling with his own challenges at home and at work and perfectionism and overcommitment and people pleasing. And so he explains that he hired an executive coach who helped him work through some of these things. And then together they had this idea, well, if it's helping me, maybe it'll help all of the doctors and all of the nurses in our healthcare system. And this is before coaching was popular in healthcare and coaching is still which, really- which year? Uh, this is, talk we're talking about 2008, 9, 10 or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the two of them designed a program, a three-day program for coaching, and they um, worked with the CEO of our company. Dr. Uh, his name is Carl Armato. And he also helped to kind of figure out how this would look in a large healthcare system. And he was a visionary and he said, this is important. There are no other healthcare systems that are doing this, taking nurses who are struggling 
out of the hospital for three days and helping them through and doctors mm -hmm. as well. So it started with that with one person and then there were two and then about five or six years ago, I went through that program myself and Dr. Jenicki saw that I was deeply passionate and I cared about this and he invited me to be on the team. So now I'm the clinical physician executive looking after the well-being of all of the physicians. And we have a nurse leader as well, and we have an organizational well-being leader as well, Taylor Warren. There's a growing group of chief well-being officers in healthcare, and now it's really considered a best practice in healthcare to end burnout, but that's only within the last five years. So this is all evolving rapidly. I understand you got to this point still to have some kind of mental struggles. You were already in a system which tried to support it and you, you mm. still mm. had to go to the edge yourself. Can you share a bit more about that? Yeah. Well, my, my struggles started before I even entered into this system. Uh, I was an anxious kid and part of my success model, the reason I was able to do well in school and go to Harvard and all the fancy schools and work so hard is because I had this very strong internal voice. You're not doing well enough. You've messed that up again. Uh, keep going, keep going, never stop. And, um, and on top of that, I was really very good at thinking about how other people were feeling and cared about that. So very empathic, which drove me into medicine. And also I was really, I was addicted to thinking about problems that could happen in the future. <laughs> like if I could, and I think it was because of some uncertainty and confusion in my childhood and some chaos there that I felt like I would have a sense of security if I could only worry about enough things in the future. And so that led to anxiety, which eventually separated me from the world. And I got treatment for, for depression as well during my training. And I had to do that in secret, even when I was doing my medicine training, because I was afraid of what other people would say. So I would hide as I would go to, to therapy. And so I entered into this larger system and the problems got worse. And I certainly had burnout, though it wasn't, even though it was a research term from Christina Maslach, you know, uh, out in California, it wasn't something that was part of our language back when I was struggling in 2006, 2007, 8, 9. Um, where, but I was deeply exhausted physically, emotionally, spiritually. I had nothing left to give. I started seeing my patients, and this is a shameful thing, but people coming to see me, I didn't see them as human beings. I saw them as like a number. I have to go to the next and the next and the next. And it was like an assembly line. And I just was trying to get through the day. And I realized that if you're just trying to get through the day, by extension, you're just trying to get through your life. And I was at that point that my, my sister, my best friend, Andrea, who was 44, she was diagnosed with a brain tumor and died over the next few years. So my life was falling apart and I was miserable at work. And it was at that time when I discovered positive psychology, meditation, went on retreats. I was already doing the work of healing when I joined this larger system, but then it got worse again because I was being judged on how much money I was making for the system and how many people I was seeing rather than the quality of the experience that I was providing and the healing experience that I was providing. So that was part of my journey. And then I started sharing my own story of burnout. And that's when our own system sort of shifted and said, we think it's important to share this story. It seems like there's a growing need for this. And part of my own healing was to work outside of my system. So in 2020, I wanted to find out what's happening globally with doctors and nurses. And so with a partner, Kelsey Trefethen in California, we founded and started the Ending Clinician Burnout Global Community and held the first global summit on burnout. And I had the pleasure of inviting and speaking with Ariana Huffington and a few other amazing people with the idea that we have to go beyond our borders of healthcare. This is not a healthcare thing. This is a Western organizational structure thing and a system problem. And using a little bit of marketing prowess, I realized <laughs> that to get this, the message that we have a crisis out there, we need to go beyond sort of the nerdy scientists and get people who have a a real platform and a voice to speak out. Before we go into your yeah. amazing book that I pre-ordered, 
I, I just stop for a moment and also what you say that, you know, you come from the healthcare system side. I come from the management consultant, seeing a lot of uh, organizations, various cultures, people. And yeah, also like having my own experience in the healthcare system. Yeah, it, it comes together. And what came to my mind while you were talking that as I am working as a coach as well, some years ago, I had the privilege to coach a doctor. And of course, you don't tell these things, but you sometimes in the business world, you say that, oh, you know, don't worry about the deadline. No one will die, you know, if you don't do that. <laughs> Can I say something like this mm. in a healthcare system? So that's mm. when I faced, you know, myself, how different it is also to coach someone in that system with all the responsibilities. Plus the system itself, it's a very tough environment. So as you say, you still do being on call emergency. You don't get your schedule in advance. It's a lot of uncertainty and you want to also have a life outside of work, like family, friends. So I, I really find this actually the most challenging system almost. Yeah, you raise a really good point, which is on the one hand, we can develop a general theory of well-being which is rooted in holistic health, viewing us as living, breathing, growing beings who exist in nature, right? Though we, are, we, we forget that. So that's on the one hand, we can come up with all these wonderful theories about you know, biological health, psychological health, spiritual health. But on the other hand, different job families have different specific challenges. And in the healthcare world, and this overlaps with other caregiving roles, whether we're talking about teachers or psychiatrists or social workers. Um, there are unique challenges that may not exist in other industries, which have to do with these existential issues of life and death, uh, where we don't receive training. Uh, many of us, at least I didn't in 1998, but now we're, we're getting a little better and I'm part of training the next generation. You can't, could you imagine sending someone into war and having them being exposed to death and dead bodies and killing people without teaching them how to process the emotions that come up with that? So because of that, we're seeing a, a, a driver of burnout in healthcare that's very distinct. And it's, some people call it moral injury, which is where we want to save someone's life, but we don't have the resources. Or we want to stand up for ourselves, but we can't. There's also another aspect, which some people call compassion fatigue. And if you talk to a nurse, you'll hear that they just can't care anymore because they're overwhelmed, understaffed, exhausted. So there's a problem in healthcare where we are expected to give and to care and to love for other people. But if our tank is empty, it's impossible to do that. And it's not just a matter of not being able to make a phone call. It's a matter of not being able to deeply empathize with someone who's suffering. And that, from my perspective as a cardiologist, has a double negative impact on their healing. Because if I'm with you and you feel like I don't care, it's one thing if it's a business deal. It's another thing if your heart is aching and I'm here to try to help you. And I'm aching myself. So there's, a, there's some unique angles we need to address in healthcare around empathic distress and really understanding empathy and discussing it deeply. What does it mean? Where does it come from? How is it lost? So I'm fascinated by that. And secretly, I believe that if we can focus on empathy and compassion, we can end up with a, a kinder, more loving environment, which I know it sounds funny to talk about love in a, a business world. I happen to know about the way that love can heal the heart. And so I've seen it in healthcare and I've seen it in my own life too. So this is where I get a little woo woo. <laughs> <laughs> but please get a bit more woo woo. This is the time for that. So uh, you are writing a book about the heart, right? And not only yes. about the heart as an organ and uh, how you as a cardiologist treat it but also as a heart of, as a symbol of something like love and compassion. Mm. Yeah, so part of the way that I'm working through this experience of my life, which is, has lo lots of ups and downs, is to try to put it on paper and to share the little that I've learned from my own experiences in a way that would help patients and caregivers and business leaders 
because I've been all of those three. And I'm doing it using some of my credibility as a heart doctor, seeing what helps beyond traditional medicine. And so the book is called Just One Heart. There's this idea that, well, if you're having a physical heart problem, just see the cardiologist and he'll give you a medication. And if your emotional heart is hurting, see a psychologist. And if they can't help you, go see a psychiatrist. But if you're having some spiritual problems, see your priest or your rabbi or your imam, and they'll help with the psychological, the spiritual heart. And in my own experience, that's a, hmm, <laughs> that's, I think, an approach that is leading to more confusion than clarity. And it's really preventing us from reaching fulfillment and freedom because we're seeking answers to different heart problems from different people when I think we're all capable of seeing the heart as a unified whole. Understanding that when we're feeling grief or longing or loss, our heart aches, literally. We can feel a pain and an, a, almost a hole in our heart. And so I'm not saying that heart doctors should become psychologists. I'm certainly not one or that rabbis should become heart surgeons. I'm just <laughs> suggesting that we can all, when we have these conversations, acknowledge that there is only one heart. And if we're looking at it from too many different angles, we forget that um, the best approach is a holistic one. And so I, I've, I've looked through history and I've looked through literature and research to find what are the qualities, what are the qualities that the healthiest, happiest, healthiest hearts have? And I can tell you from my patients that there are seven qualities that they have these happen to be the same qualities of the best leaders in any industry. And these are qualities, if you look in the literature, there's the phrases about the heart. So we talk about a wise heart or an open heart or a whole heart or a courageous heart or a warm heart. So I said, there's something here. There must be something to this. What are the qualities? And, and I found these timeless traits of the heart that if we develop them, we tend to have more psychological well-being, whether we're at work or we're at home. And when we're missing them, our physical hearts suffer and emotional hearts, social hearts and spiritual hearts. And the qualities are a steadiness of heart, calm, balance, a wisdom of the heart. So trusting the intuition of both our emotions and our uh, intellect, an openness of heart. So being ready for new ideas and welcoming of new people, inclusiveness, a wholeness of heart, which has to do with not only an integrity within ourselves and looking and healing our past wounds, but also a wholeness, realizing that we are not only unto ourselves, we're connected with others, people we're with and with the entire world. And we are interconnected. COVID taught, taught us that. And then courage. Uh, it takes courage to live. <laughs> It really does, not just when we're sick, so courageous heart. So I have a chapter on courage. And then I know a lot of people who are very serious about all these things, but they're missing an element of lightness. So, and I was missing that myself. I was very heavy hearted for a long time when I was burnt out and depressed. And so I studied how can I develop a lightness of my heart so I can feel more joy. And this is the, the science of positive psychology. And the point of all of these is the seventh quality, the seventh trait of the heart is the one that heals, and that's warmth. There's mm -hmm. a lot of coldness and cruelty in our business world and toxic leadership and unsafe environments, and also in our political realm. There's so much hatred and violence that's leading to physical illness as well. So the final chapter is how do we develop a warm heart in a cold world? Hmm. How is the resonance so far from other doctors in your field? When I'm thinking about resonance with other people and messages that may be new, I think about how they might challenge existing beliefs and might challenge cultural norms. And medicine in the West, I'm not talking about Eastern medicine because Eastern medicine, whether you're talking about Ayurveda or traditional Chinese medicine, for 3,000 years, these traditions have included these other aspects of the heart. In fact, in Chinese and in other languages, there's no separate word for mind and heart. It's just one word. And so in the Western world, what you're asking about, there is resistance. Uh, and I see the resistance the same as any audience I come to um, that doesn't know me, let's say. 
about 20 or 30 percent are really curious and excited and maybe already know that this these practices help and that there's something to this path about maybe 30 or 40 percent are curious but not sure and then about 20 or 30 percent are have folded arms and squinty eyes and giving me mean looks and throwing tomatoes at me saying you're crazy wacko <laughs> <laughs> so the reception uh, is around that and my secret hope is that by communicating in a clear way that's accessible not just to physicians but to our patients who really are missing out there's a reason that our patients whether cardiologists or lung doctors they're going elsewhere after they leave our office they're going to holistic doctors they're going to the self-help section they're going to buy supplements that some of them work some of them don't and it's a multi-billion dollar business that's comparable to our healthcare system because people aren't getting the care that they really feel like they're needing so i have no doubt that there is some validity to this approach and it's i'm not the first person to talk about the connection between the mind and the heart and the body mm -hmm. and i certainly won't be the last and i'm hoping that between you and everyone in the business world who's taking this approach as well realizing that well-being is not just physical it's not just mental it's not all even visible i'm hoping that together we can each do our small part i am with you <laughs> that's why we are here so definitely up for this challenge how uh, does this or these seven points that you mentioned embody in your interaction with patients in two ways the first is always to practice them myself. I like teachers who are actually doing what they're saying. <laughs> the Authenticity, that's what we like oh. in the business world. <laughs> Authenticity, you can see yeah. if somebody is just checking a box or telling you to do something that they haven't done themselves, you're not likely to follow that person. It's the same thing in medicine. If I need to develop trust with my patients, and that's the most important thing, and I don't have time. I don't have the luxury of an hour or two hour to get to know someone. I have to establish trust beginning in, in 30 seconds and then maybe five minutes and maybe 10 minutes. And so that requires a certain type of presence and openness and empathy. And without that, there is no trust and there is no care and patients will suffer because they won't share with me what I need to hear and I won't be able to share with them what they might need to hear. So it starts with steadiness, the first quality. I could be warm hearted, but if I'm all over the place thinking about yesterday and tomorrow, and I'm nervous and anxious all the time, I can't be open in order to be a vessel or a space for you to open up. And so I have to steady myself. I do that, as I mentioned, before going into the room. I do that with a meditation practice before and after. And sometimes I do it in the room itself. When I'm using my stethoscope to listen to someone's heart, I'll spend a little extra time there. I'm listening, but I'm also checking my own heart. I'm feeling inside of myself, how is my heart in this moment? If I notice that I'm a little bit on edge, I'll just relax my shoulders. I'll slow down. I think people can feel that. That's just one example. And then I'll try and help my patients with that steadiness. In fact, I would say that a large percentage of the symptoms that my patients have, many of them come to me not because they have a problem with their heart, but because they're feeling symptoms from the heart. And it results from a lack of steadiness. But it's not a steadiness in the heart that starts it. It's an unsteadiness in the mind. And so often what I'll do at the end of a visit is I'll, if I get a sense of unsteadiness or people say I'm really stressed, and by the way, I ask everyone, I say, how's life? How's your family? How are your friends? And I kind of get a sense of how connected this person is with the world and with others and with themselves. And I can then from that get a sense if they're feeling grounded and any kind of inner peace or inner imbalance. And at the end of the visit, I'll invite them into a, a meditation together. So I don't just guide them, but I do it with them. And so I'm setting an example that even the doctor needs to do these practices to ground myself. And I give them a gift that they can take away more powerful than many medications, which is the ability to steady their mind, to steady their body, to steady their breath in a world that just is wild as soon as they walk out the door. 
And so that's one example. And then I do the same thing with wisdom, where I try to think, well, what would the wise person do in this moment? And I help my patients make wise decisions as well that aren't necessarily irrational or tainted by natural cognitive distortions and biases. So I do a little bit of CBT and these kinds of things. And then openness of heart. I have patients who are very rigid in their thinking, and I just invite them with various questions, gently inviting them to think in new ways that might offer more flexibility uh, in their lives and in their health. So, and it goes on and wholeness and courage and lightness. And then warmth is the guiding trait that I find that that's what people are wanting right now in health and healthcare. We want warmth. We want connection. We want empathy. We want compassion. We want love. And so all of the seven are really ways of leading to love. As you were talking, you know what came to my mind? I know that you are also a fan of Gabor Mate. And in his book, The Myth of Norma, he talks about exactly this. When people have a bigger problem, they go to an ologist, whatever it is. They are not really asked how they live, how they live their lives. And as you were talking, I just love to hear that you do this. So mm. and definitely this is the where the future of medicine should go. He is a pioneer in helping us understand trauma. Mm -hmm. And uh, more and more of us have to understand that. And uh, he's also, he is someone who is authentic and he embodies these practices, if you meet him or speak with him, you get a sense of this steadiness and deep empathy and compassion for not just you, but for all people. Uh, and it comes yeah. out in his writing as well. So yes, I'm a huge fan. You know, I, I have also a special connection with him as he's also Hungarian originally, like me. Ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I, reading his book, it's a bit of a personal story. It really helped to understand me a trauma that I was not even aware of. But mm. it's just amazing, you know, that uh, mm. I didn't have to go to a therapist or anything. Just reading the book, it helped me to, to get deeper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amazing. Maybe one day we could even have him on this podcast. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. I know we are getting to the end uh, of, of this talk. One, Just one reflection that still came to my mind from a systemic side. Some researchers in HR, they look at the healthcare system as something where in terms of finding your purpose as an employee, it's in a way easier to, you know, to connect to that because you work on someone's that being directly and has, mm. on the other hand, is such a challenging system. So I find this very controversial and this is a fascinating controversy in a way. Yeah, I know what you're referring to. You know, there's some good research out of McKinsey that shows that when an employee feels a sense of connection with the, the meaning and purpose of the work, their productivity goes up 100, 200, 300 yeah. percent. And the more connected we feel to purpose on not just one level in terms of what's the outcome or the client, but on all levels, what is the, the meaning of what I'm doing on a societal level? What does it mean for mm -hmm. our globe on a, which is yeah. where, you know, impact comes in. And what you're saying is true, that in healthcare, we have an advantage. We can often see when someone else gets better, because if we're the doctor ourselves, I can see someone getting better. Whereas this is now, you know, going back a hundred years in Western business, there's a disconnection between the worker and the results of their labor. And so we don't see the benefits. And so, but we still have practices that are common in healthcare and other businesses where it's helpful to bring in somebody, bring in a client, bring in a patient to talk to all of the department and say, you help me, you save my life. And that helps people reconnect with the purpose because right now in healthcare, there's a disconnection. We can't feel, we can't even appreciate the benefits of the work we're doing because some of us are so exhausted psychologically, emotionally, and some of us have experienced trauma ourselves, you know, one in five or six nurses has been physically attacked. Many, many people, particularly women and minorities and new hires feel psychologically unsafe in an often toxic work environment. So I think we have a lot of work to do. In addition to reconnecting with purpose, we have to begin with safety as well. So there's so many factors on an organizational level that if you just yeah. ask, you hear all of these, these pain points. You mentioned the term psychological safety, even, you know, when Amy Edmondson coined this term, she did a research in a hospital. So the original yeah, research comes from that environment. What would be your ultimate advice for 
future well-being leaders, either in the medical environment, healthcare sector, or in general? Well, uh, my first advice would be to lead from a place of internal uh, integrity. So uh, I know that for myself, it's very easy to become out of integrity. So if I say, the better a job you do, the more people ask you to help them. And if you say yes, and yes, and yes, then suddenly your workout maybe gets canceled and you don't go to your child's play performance and you don't say uh, hi to your spouse, you run out the door. And then we end up trying to be leaders for other people's well-being without looking after our own sense of balance. So I would say the first thing for me is always checking our own sense of well-being, whatever that means, and leading from that place. The second piece would be to realize that there's a tendency to, when we hear the word leader, we think about one person. I am the leader. And I think it's a tricky thing because the best leaders that I know and the leader that I hope to be is somebody that is collaborative, not someone who is telling everyone else what to do, but really trying to bring out the best in others. So my advice, the second piece would be find other people who share similar values, core values about well-being and health and stick with them and learn from them and be open to sharing with them and create a team that eventually will grow. So that would be the second piece there. I guess the third piece would be don't offer solutions to people that they're not asking for. I would say this is, comes from my practice as a physician. I spent the first 10 years of my medical practice right away knowing what the diagnosis was and deciding in my mind what this person needed and then forcing it on them. And they would walk out the door and they wouldn't come back and see me because I didn't really listen. And so the fourth piece would be start by listening to what the real pain, where it's coming from, where the suffering is coming from. If you care about well-being, it's a lot of work to do. You have to start somewhere. Start with what people are really needing first. You can only do that by being humble. Uh, even though you may have all the solutions or think you have all the right solutions, you don't know what the solution is for the per next person in front of you. And then I would say it's important to balance um, the needs of well-being with the needs of the organization. You have to have alignment of the business values, whether it's profits or growth or staffing, whatever it is, these are real. And we don't live in an ashram or in a cave somewhere where we can just eat vegetables and do yoga all day. If we're living in the world of modern business, it's complex and we have to look at profits. So fortunately, we now know that there's a strong business case to be made for well-being, that well-being doesn't take away from profits. It's a small investment with a huge ROI. So those are just a few thoughts that come to mind as you ask. Thank you. The one that most resonates with me is the first one I would interpret, put your own oxygen mask first. So I like to focus in these conversations on the, the systemic change and the organizational change. But at the end, it all starts with us individuals. Mm -hmm. We cannot change the system if we don't practice it ourselves. Totally. Jonathan, I am really grateful for you and for your time. And I would be the happiest if you could also guide us to a closing mindful exercise. I'm happy to. Rekha, this has been a real pleasure chatting with you again. And I look forward to our next conversation. And thank you for all the work that you do. You have such a big heart and you care so deeply. And it comes out in this conversation and all of your conversations. So thank you for the invitation to join you. My pleasure. Taking a, a, a nice deep breath in, exhaling slowly and completely, allowing your eyes to close if that feels comfortable or just softly gazing in front of you, letting your feet settle on the ground and your thighs settle into the chair, allowing your breath to return to its natural rhythm in and out through the nostrils. And just checking in now, getting a, a sense of how the body is feeling after this conversation. Are there areas of tightness, contraction? Are there areas of ease and 
perhaps openness. What's the quality of the breath right now? Is it slow and choppy? Is it steady, and easy? What's the quality of the mind right now? Is it active? Is it quiet? Is it troubled? Is it easeful? And in this brief moment of stillness and quiet, I'm checking into the space around the heart, asking yourself, how am I? Asking your heart, what are you needing more of? Perhaps the heart is needing what it has, a sense of connection from this conversation, of new ideas, a sense of hope. Maybe it's needing more balance, more freedom, control, maybe crying for a, more justice and equity, safety, whatever it needs. Just ask your heart, what are you needing right now? And then allowing that feeling to settle and seeing if you can tap into a sense of gratitude for one small thing, maybe a person or an experience, something you have in your life. Now letting go of that and bringing to mind someone that loves you or someone that's ever loved you, or someone that you love. And it doesn't have to be passionate romantic love. It could simply be deep respect and admiration, friendship, friendliness, kindness. Now with these sense of what your heart is needing and the sense of gratitude and a sense of love. Deciding on what your intention is for the rest of the day when you finish this podcast, you move on with your activities. And intention not in the sense of what do I want to do next, more in the sense of who do I want to be today? Who do I want to be today? You have a choice. And letting that intention grow inside your heart, inside your body, even extending beyond your body, radiating outwards. Letting that be your guide. Letting go of the intention, coming back to the sensations of the body, sitting, breathing, just being, giving yourself a little pat on the back for taking this time for self-care, checking in, and considering the benefits of this brief practice on the people in your life, if you were the person that you said that you want to be. When you're ready, giving a wiggle to your fingers and toes and shoulders and letting your eyes open when it feels right. A little stretch. Rekha, thank you. It feels amazing. Thanks for everyone who listened to it. I'm looking forward to have your book in my hands. <laughs> <laughs> my pleasure. You can find more information about Jonathan's upcoming book, Just One Heart, on Jonathan's website that I am linking in the description of this podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Wellbeing Designers podcast. If you would like to keep in touch with me, with us, sign up to the Wellbeing Designers newsletter. You can do this on our website, www.wellbeing.design. You can reach out to me via the website or via LinkedIn. 
I am very happy to connect with other well-being designers from all over the world. Remember, together we can design a human-centric work life and the future of well-being. Oh, 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 oh,